All right, so in this video, we're gonna go over the process of replacing a hall sensor inside a hub motor. And this is one of the more common hub motor repair operations that comes up in the field of e-bike service and repair. Um, in this particular case, we have a geared easy motor that's been disassembled. Um, and this was a case where the customer had this installed on a bike without a torque arm. Uh, when they ran this motor at 52 volts, it generated quite a bit of torque on the axle. The axle spun, twisted, and it twisted and damaged the cable running through the motor. Um, so the uh, person who did that then came in here to repair this motor. Um, we supplied a replacement cable harness for him. Um, and uh, similar to the GMAT cable harness replacement video that was fished through the axle, soldered to all these things. But when the motor was reassembled, it didn't run. It made a bunch of buzzy vibration sounds. So this is a case where we suspect then that there's a damaged hall sensor. Now that can happen pretty easily in cases where you have an axle spin out because when the cables twist up, you can shear through the insulation and then it can short one of the hall sensor wires to one of the phase wires. And the phase wires can have the full battery voltage on them and that will put 36 or 52 volts on one of the hall chips and that itself can fry one of the chips. Uh, so here we have a very generic uh, Chinese hall tester um, and this just can illustrate what's going on. Uh, we've terminated these with the same plugs that we have on our motor cable, if I turn that on, these little LEDs here are the yellow, green, and blue hall signals. Uh, you can ignore the red power one. And normally as the motor turns, we should see all three of those take turns turning on and off. But you'll notice that only the left two are toggling, uh, the yellow and the green, and the blue hall signal is staying lit up the whole time. All right, so that will be the case if there's a break in the wiring. So if one of the wires is, uh, um, is actually severed, um, but it can also be the case if the hall chip itself has been damaged. So most people don't have a hall tester like this, but you can easily measure the state of the signals just using a conventional multimeter. Um, with the motor open like this, uh, it's quite a bit easier to measure those sensors than when the motor is closed. Uh, you can measure it on a um, on a closed motor, if you have a connector like this JST plug, where you can actually stick your probes in the back of the connector. In fact, I might as well do that here because that's how you would typically do this troubleshooting on your bicycle. So you can put the black probe into one of the ground pins, and then we can put the measuring probe into each of the three different signal wires. So for instance, if I put this between the black and the yellow signal wire, um, get that there and that there, um, now we can look at the multimeter here and see the voltage. So you see that we're 4.8 volts. Can you see that? Yeah. And as I turn the motor, that drops down to zero volts. And then that increases back to 4.9 volts and then drops down to zero volts based on which magnet is over that specific sensor. Um, so that's the yellow sensor, which we knew was working fine. We're now gonna move this probe over to the blue sensor. Um, so now I'm going between the common and the blue. Um, so if I measure the voltage here, we're now sitting at 0.5 volts. Well, that's not uh, consistent with what we saw on the yellow one. And now as I move the motor, you'll see that this goes to 2.0 volts and then drops down to 0 0.58 volts. And then two volts and then 0.5 volts. So this hall chip is still functioning at some level. It's still toggling between a high voltage and a low voltage, but going from 0.5 volts to two volts isn't enough to trigger the motor controller to think that the hall has actually changed states. Um, so this would be a case where you could, somebody could have potentially measured the voltage and seen it toggle and assumed that the hall was good, but you have to pay attention to the actual voltage thresholds that it's going between. Um, and it really should go all the way down to very close to zero volts at the uh, zero volt state of the hall since it's an open collector transistor. So we know now that we have a blue hall sensor that's been compromised um, and that needs to be replaced in order for this motor to be functional again. So the motor that we're working with here, this easy motor, is not a very easy... <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very easy motor to do a hall sensor replacement on uh, because it's not easy to... <laughs> okay. Easy motor. Easy motor. Um, so the easy motor that they're repairing here is one that's a particularly difficult hall 
uh, replacement job. Um, part of that is because the stator of this motor doesn't separate easily from the rotor, so you don't really have easy access to the hull chip itself. The hull sensor is glued into a little slot on the side of a stator there, but they've also glued, covered with glue, all the solder point connections to the circuit board. Um, so in order for us to put a replacement sensor in here, we're going to have to chip off that epoxy, um, we're going to have to desolder the leads that are in there, and then we're going to somehow find a way to chip that hull sensor out of its stator, uh, pull it out, and then chew away enough of an opening so that we can glue a replacement sensor in the same position and then bend the leads over to make contact with that pad. Uh, but once we do that, we should have a working motor again. Uh, so just to be totally sure that I've got the right sensor, um, on this little indicator, it indicated it was a blue wire. Uh, we can see the blue wire where it's soldered to this uh, blue trace on the circuit board. So in theory, it would be this sensor here that has the issue, and I can just confirm that by measuring right at the actual pins. Uh, so yeah, so now you can see that that's sitting just at two volts rather than going up to close to five volts. So it's this middle sensor here that's the problem that we want to replace. Uh, so the first step here is, is, is gonna be trying to chip away the covering over top of those pads. I've got a little wood chisel here. Um, we'll see if that's appropriately delicate, but also strong enough to get this off. Um, you know, I think that this, this is actually quite a firm adhesive that's on here. Uh, we want to avoid tearing the trace. There we go. So good. That was brittle enough that it kind of popped off once I got under the corner. And you notice that I'm prying in an area of the circuit board where we don't have any of the traces. If you start chipping at it where there's copper, you risk cutting right through that. So now I've been able to successfully uh, free the covering that was over here. Uh, what we're going to do now is cut the three leads over there. Um, and then try to use a small little screwdriver to punch this existing hall sensor out of the way. Uh, so let's take this over to the vise. I'm just going to try using a slot headed screwdriver here with a little hammer to punch that out. Ah, oh, that worked perfectly. So now you can see that the, the glue cracked and broke over sideways. So now if I get a little side snip, Great. Uh, so there you see the original hall sensor that was taken out. One thing to try and pay attention to when you are doing the hall re removal is the uh, see which orientation the hall sensor is facing. You'll notice that it has this 45 degree facet on the top on one of the faces. Um, that's a standard way to let you know which is pin one, which is pin three. If you install the hall sensor flip the other way, so 180 degrees, uh, then you're going to have the wrong pins connected to five volts and grounds and the hall sensor will not work. Uh, so make sure to, to pay attention on the orientation. There's no real standard, although we, we do see more often than not. It's they're designed with the, the chamfered face facing outside the stator. Um, so now what we're going to do is desolder the remaining pins that we snipped off there, and then we're going to get a replacement hall chip that will glue into place and fold the, the leads over to solder them. I'm just grabbing the lead with the needle nose pliers. No. Great. Pull both of them out there. Yeah, I got, well, I did the first one and then I got both in that second one. It's for the replacement hall sensor, it's not going to be very easy to feed the leads back through those holes, but there's really no reason to do that. Uh, what we're going to do when we, after we glue this replacement, we're just going to bend the leads over and solder them to the top surface uh, rather than trying to go in from the underside, because to do that, we'd have to remove the whole hall PCB, but given that it's glued in place through the other sensors, uh, that'd be a lot more rework. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the next step now is going to be to insert the hull here, uh, and then we're just going to glue that with five minute epoxy. And then once the glue is set, we'll uh, complete the soldering job. And so the, the replacement hull sensor that I have here is a Honeywell SS41. Um, there's lots and lots of makes and models of hull sensor chips. It's really good to specify one that has a high temperature rating. Uh, one of the causes of hull failures in hub motors is the motor core getting too hot uh, and exceeding the temperature spec. So you want something that is uh, intended for high temp applications when you're mounting it to a motor stator like this. So now let's grab some five minute epoxy and then something to mix it with. Slice dollops. And then it had the chamfers facing up. Ah. So this piece of wax paper here now is uh, providing a physical separator so that the epoxy doesn't glue itself onto the magnets. Um, and it also is helping push the hall sensor down, just holding it in position while we're waiting for the epoxy to cure. Uh, so now we sit here and wait for the epoxy to cure.
Fine. Now that the epoxy is nice and cured, we're going to remove the insulating slit between the hall sensor and the stator and bend the leads over and simply solder them back to the PCB, making sure that they're pushed down as flush as possible so that they're not going to physically interfere or rub against the inside of the motor casing. Oh, yeah. So now, um, so here I'm going to move the solder, put it down with that. Okay. Uh, so here I decided to trim them after I soldered rather than before. That in hindsight was a bit of a mistake. I probably should have trimmed those guys first. Oh well. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, if we wanted to repeat what was on here, we could put epoxy over top of the uh, joint that we just made. The purpose for doing that would be to potentially protect them against corrosion maybe, um, but it's not really gonna have much of an effect because the leads themselves aren't covered in epoxy. So any risk of corrosion that would be saved by having it on the PCB is just going to be translated right down on the leg. So we're going to reassemble the motor with the uh, wires exposed like that. But if you are concerned about water ingress in your motor and keeping it as uh, uh, protected as possible against that, you could cover everything right down to where the leads go into the back of the hall mm -hmm. uh, with some kind of coating or sealant. Uh, so, yeah, so now before we put the motor back together, we obviously want to just check to make sure that our hall repair worked. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating than going through all the effort of reassembling the hub only to find that you made a mistake and that it's not actually fixed the problem that you had. So we will reconnect our hall tester and then see what happens now with that blue hall when we rotate the motor. So now we see as we rotate this, all three of the hall sensors are toggling and they're all toggling in uh, quadrature sequence or 120 degrees out of phase. Um, you want to make sure that you don't have a state where all three hall sensors are off or all three hall sensors are on. Uh, if you have a 120 degree motor, that would mean that the hall sensor was the wrong polarity for the one that it replaced. Uh, so now we see there's always one on or one off and they're alternating in the correct sequence. Uh, so now we're going to put a fresh bead of silicone on the side cover plate and hope that the motor all runs perfectly well once it's screwed back together. Um, and one of the things while well, this cable harness was being replaced is that we decided to include one of the torque arms on here and that'll allow us to have a torque arm both on the cable side and on the non-cable side so we can double it up with double torque arms to prevent this kind of spin-out incident from happening again. Woohoo!